So we are going to consider the non-relativistic limit. Last time we have considered the extreme non-relativistic limit, which was the particle at rest. And we have seen that we could classify the particle solutions at rest to be the common eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, obviously, because we are talking about the energy eigenstates. And also a new operator called the spin sigma, which we have defined eventually. We are going to elaborate on it and we are going to discuss the actual operations related to that later. But anyway, we have seen that there are four solutions. Two of them are positive energy, E, one of them being spin up, spin down. The other two are the negative energy, even at rest. And one of them being spin up, the other spin down. And we'll see that eventually all these four solutions uh, are the part of the completeness. You know, you need four in the relative case. Now, we also discussed the classical limit and which enabled us to get the, the well-known Lorentz force equation. Now we are going to discuss the, the non-relativistic limit associated with the atomic physics set. Okay, this is the V axis and here is the C, the speed of light, the upper limit of all the signals. And that's the zero. Of course, speed, the lowest value for the speed is zero. This is the extreme non-relativistic. This is the extreme relativistic limit. This is photon, this is particle objects at rest. And this region is the atomic physics region. And there we know quite well that the average speed in the atoms of the, of the electrons are alpha times the C. It is really a nice relationship. Eventually you'll see that this will help us to clarify several issues. There are two fundamental constants essentially entering into the game. C is obviously the speed of light. And the relative speed is V over C is a, a degree of relativity, uh, how much the relativity is involved with. And so C is relativity. And this is quantum. That at the atomic level, two fundamental constants. One is a measure of quantum at the atomic scale. Two fundamental constants are intermingled, related. One is a measure of the quantumness, the other is a measure of relativityness. That's a bad English, so I made it up. <laughs> so let's see how then we develop the algorithm of introducing going to this limit, this region, atomic physics region. Well, for that, we have started estimating the energies associated with the atomic physics that what kind of energies we have. One have we have the rest mass energies of the electron. That is half a million electron volts. And the other is the binding energy of the atomic states. Well, uh, if you remember the hydrogen, uh, you know, the usual expression, and if you go to the ground state of the hydrogen, and the magnitude of it is 13.6 electron volt. So that gives you a good ground of sort of introducing the algorithm. You see, bind, the binding energies, despite the fact that all the chemical energies in life are associated with this, they are very low as compared to the rest mass energies. Therefore, this will set the scale and we are going to take it as a reference. And if we look at the energy, and put, focus on the positive energy sector only because we are doing order of magnitude estimation only, then remembering this form, 
of the relativistic energy that's positive. I emphasize that I'm focusing on the positive energy sector because in principle this is plus and minus obviously. So if you take the rest mass energy out, and what you have inside is P squared divided by M squared C squared, right? And that's the square root. The reason why I did that is to see that this dimensionless to see the magnitude of this dimensionless constant. If you divide this by 2m, so therefore this becomes one half of mc squared. So you can also, referring to the virial theorem, you know that numerator is at the order of the binding energy, which is about 10 electron volts. And the denominator is half the rest mass of the electron at the order of several hundred thousand electron volts. So that's a very small number. And so these things are really tied together. So how do I really approximate this? Well, as this is a small number, call it epsilon. Then you expand this into binomial, binomial form, which is mc squared plus 1, the, then a, one half of that, because the binomial expansion has that power. P squared divided by 2m squared c squared, right? That's the expression to the leading order. And also, you can see that there will be a, a higher order. Well, what, what is the coefficient, first of all? 1 half times 1 half minus 1, which is minus a half, minus a quarter, divided by 4 minus 1 over 8. P squared squared divided by m to the 4, c to the 4, plus minus. That is the way this can be expanded. So if you look at now the leading terms, the leading term is mc squared plus, what about this one? This is p squared divided by 2m, obviously. And this one is p squared squared divided by 8 m cube c squared. All have the correct dimensions, right? The dimension of the energy. So the leading term in this free particle relativistic energy is the rest mass energy plus the Newtonian kinetic energy plus the corrections coming from the relativistic region. Obviously, if I say that because of, although this is small, V over C is small enough, alpha, which is about an order of 1%, still a large number, right? Because C is large, 300,000 kilometers per second. Therefore, for that regime, this term is to be taken into account. Anyway, you'll see that all these things will follow from the Dirac's equation. So, but let me set the algorithm then. The large scale of energy is the rest mass energy. So if I'm going to look at the Dirac equation, which is, of course, the entity in question in the equation is this four-dimensional spinner, which is function of space and time. I will redefine it as minus i over h bar mc squared t times two component spinners. So I'm, I'm not really looking at, in principle, when you really see this factor coming out, you may have the wrong impression that I am looking for the stationary state solutions. So this is the typical time dependence. The rest are time independent. It's not the case. What I am doing is I take this fast oscillating factor out so that in the remaining part, which is a four component spinner, which I have written in the form of two two component spinners, their behavior in time is very smooth. They don't change much in time. That's the idea. Change rather slowly in time. I hope you appreciate this. 
this is very large. This, this is the large scale in the game. So as it is the inverse of the period of that oscillatory function, so it is large period is uh, Q over T. The inverse is the period. That's large, so your period is very small. So that represents a very fast oscillation. Okay, period is very small, frequency is very high. So I have taken this factor out. So whenever you are asked to uh, uh, consider the non-relativistic approximation, whether it is the full Dirac equation that is time dependent or the energy eigenvalue equation in related to the stationary states, you have to always factor out this large mass in, the, in that particular form. Okay, if that's the case, then we can proceed with the equation. For the, consider the Dirac equation for the interaction case. I could have done it for the free Dirac equation, that's too trivial. I leave it for you to consider as a private homework always, so please do it on your own. So let's consider the Dirac equation for the in the interacting case. What was the form of the equation? We, we have developed the Dirac equation in that form. HD is the Dirac Hamiltonian. What is that Dirac Hamiltonian? C alpha dot pi m c squared beta plus e phi. Phi is the scalar potential of the electromagnetism. We represent the electromagnetism with a set of potentials, the vector and the <coughs> scale, right? That is A mu or it's a four vector, the zeroth component is the scalar potential and the vector part is the vector potential and that's the Dirac Hamiltonian. So let's, as a first step, let's introduce that. <coughs> okay. So let me consider the left-hand side and right-hand side separately and then reduce the equation. So what is the left-hand side? I h bar d psi dt is I h bar. First we have the derivative of the exponential time factor which is minus I over h bar mc squared times the e to the minus i over h bar mc squared t times phi and chi, let me use this shorthand. And next, again the same factor, so let me use, denote it as simply exponential times d by dt phi and chi. So this is the entire left-hand side. You see, this is, there are two factors in here. You run the derivative on both. So what is uh, this is, I can write this as finally, e to the minus i over h bar mc squared t. I factored that. What is remaining is <coughs> There is i h bar m1 over i h bar, so it is m c squared is the first term. And second one, is, that's times phi and chi, plus i h bar d by dt phi and chi. Nice, that is the left hand side of the equation. And what about the right hand side? Right hand side is obtained by taking this entire Hamiltonian and remembering the matrix representations of the alpha and beta matrices and we can write the right hand side then as first of all the entire Hamiltonian should be written in the 4 by 4 matrix form which is mc squared well e phi 
plus the mc squared, the block 2 by 2 matrix. And C, that's the two dimensional ident identity, that's the shorthand. So C, sigma dot pi, because remember alpha are of diagonal 2 by 2 block matrices. C, sigma dot pi, and here E phi minus MC squared, the identity times phi and chi. So that's the right hand side of the equation. So if we equate the left and right hand sides, then what we get, first of all, notice that if I write, uh, for, sorry, we forgot to put in the exponential in here, so let's put it all, all the way out, exponential, that one. As there is no time derivative operators or anything, that's already an overall factor. So when you are equating the left and right hand sides, the exponential of the time cancels in both sides. That against that. And this can be moved to the right hand side to affect the diagonal part. The left hand side stays the same, so I have the equation IH bar d by dt phi and chi as defined in there, phi and chi. And the right hand side are, notice that this mc squared is cancelled against that because there's an identity in here mc squared up in the lower low left block and mc squared down in the right block. So this goes away. E phi, two-dimensional identity, c sigma dot pi, c sigma dot pi, e phi minus twice mc squared, the identity, two-dimensional identity, phi and chi. So the equation is really simplified, somewhat. Phi and chi are still full space and time dependent two component spinners. And we have, this is yet exact because we haven't made any approximation. It is only the, that fast oscillating time factor is cancelled out in both sides. And phi and chi are not smooth functions of t. They do not change very fast. You'll see that that property will play a role in comparing different terms in this game. So let me write now the equation. This is a 4 by 4 equation as both sides are four dimensional. If I write now the equation for the upper component, it is C sigma dot pi chi plus E phi phi. Please do not confuse the two sets of phi. The potential phi is straight phi. My two component upper spinner is the curly phi, okay. So this is the upper component of the equation. And we have a similar lower component, d chi dt is c sigma dot pi phi plus E phi minus 2mc squared times chi. Okay, there are two two-component spinner equations. They're coupled, you see, and phi and chi parts are coupled in both. Yet exact. We haven't carried out any approximation yet, although we have made the necessary preparations, we haven't done any approximation yet. Now we can start approximating. What is the approximation? Let's look at the second. You know, this second component, as we have felt explicitly by looking at the rest solutions, the upper components are related to the positive energy, the lower two components are related to negative energy. And if we are going to the non-relativistic limit, the only spinner that we have in non-relativistic spin is the Pauli spinner, and there are two components. So obviously it is the upper part will carry over to the non-relativistic limit. 
lower part will be, as they are related to the negative energy, so they should somehow decouple and we can really feel it. So let's focus on the second equation involving chi mostly here. Notice that there is this variation of chi in time. We know that both phi and chi slowly vary and there is an IH bar multiplying it. So it's a small quantity. And there is this phi and everything. Let's keep it in there. And we can compare the two terms appearing in the brackets. E phi is typical electrostatic energy, right? So well, how do we estimate it? Using Virial theorem, it's at the order of atomic binding energy, half or twice, 10 electron volts. This is 1 million electron volt, twice the rest mass of the energy. So we can start our non-relativistic approximation in this bracket and we neglect this term as compared to this as the first step. And also, this is a, one of the virtues of factoring that fast oscillation part out. So that's a very smooth varying thing times an h bar, small thing. So we drop that one as well. So this is the place I start the non-relativistic approximation. I will write it to the corner. So this equation is approximated dropping that term and that term, what is left over is Left hand side is zero, right hand side I have this term minus 2mc squared chi. Now that's an approximate zero, right? Because we are approximating, okay, which is beautiful because it relates the two components, this one to that one in the following manner chi then in the non-relativistic approximation is 1 over 2 mc sigma dot pi phi. Is this now consistent with the philosophy of our approximation? What is this? This is the kinetic momentum. Remember the definition we worked out in detail before. It is this quantity. P is the canonical momentum and pi is the kinetic momentum. So if I'm going to do an order of magnitude estimation, there's the P and the MC. P is MV. Well, this entire thing is MV really. This entire thing is MV. If you want to see the relationship M's cancel and we have V over C, right? So this tells me that chi is order V over C times the phi. Very good. So because in this non-relativistic approximation, I keep the terms of order, linear order in V over C. If you get the V over C zero, you get the extreme non-relativistic limit. If you would like to get the corrections coming from the relativistic regime, you have to retain terms of linear order in V over C. That's what we are doing. And so chi is indeed V over C in, in that, uh, at the order V over C. If you let V over C goes to zero, it goes to zero, decouples. So at very non-relativistic limits, when V over C is very small, smaller than 1%, it's for the ordinary speeds that you can imagine. The, what is the fastest? 1,000 kilometers per hour, the, the aeroplanes, right? So what about the speed of light? If you multiply the 300,000 by 3,600, you get, that's the amount of kilometer that you get. It's how much is it? 300,000 times 1,000 is 3 million, so 1 billion kilometer per hour. 
so obviously. For ordinary speeds, it doesn't have to be at rest. V over C is practically small, zero, so you don't have any correction. But only for these reasonably non-relativistic values like alpha times C, you need that correction. Otherwise, it decouples altogether and there is no trace of the, the lower component, which is negative energy part in the non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So this is nice to have this all order V over C that this is as compared to that. Or chi or phi is that, if you want. Very good, let's proceed. If this is the main result that we obtained by doing this approximation, what we can do now is the second equation is done, we go to the first equation and substitute that expression up in there. So what was the first equation? Left hand side was IH bar d phi dt and in the right hand side the first term was C times sigma pi C times sigma pi times chi, right? And chi is this 1 over 2mc sigma dot pi phi and also the e phi Indeed, a nice equation involving only the two components, spinner phi, and so it's going to be the natural uh, entity in the non-relativistic limit because we know that in non-relativistic regime, the spinners are two component Pauli spinners. Well, the C cancels, and I can write this as 1 over 2m sigma dot sigma dot pi squared plus e phi phi. So phi is a two component spinner. The left hand side has the usual form. Right hand side, uh, right -hand side also has the usual form. A Hamiltonian times phi. So we are in the right track. Let's work out the details of this new Hamiltonian. And let's see what we get. We'll see some certain victories victories of the Dirac equation already making themselves manifest at that stage. So, let me compute this sigma dot pi squared. How do we do that? Sigma i, sigma j, repeated indices are summed over pi i pi j. I, there is sum over i, sum over j, and then I use the famous identity of the Pauli matrices, which is epsilon i j k sigma k. So repeated in this is sum. The first term, of course, times an identity, if you want to see the matrix nature, it's two by two matrices. Then the first term becomes pi squared, delta ij summation. The second one becomes i times epsilon ijk sigma k pi i pi j. Beautiful. So it is this term. Obviously, the first term is something that you, which is well recognized. already from uh, non relative quantum mechanics, there is something new coming from the relativistic part. It is this term, which we need to elaborate a little further. Let's do that. Perhaps at this level you can write this, this H sort of non-relativistic H, denoted as HNR, we know that it's going to be the Pauli's. So what is HNR then? HNR is 1 over 2m pi squared plus e phi. That is the first term coming from here. And e phi, I have put that together. And what is the extra? The extra is i over 2m 
epsilon i j k sigma k pi i pi j. All the repeated indices are summed over, obviously. Okay. So let's work this out. If there is anything exotic or nice coming from the relativity, it's going to be in this term. First of all, remember, it is symmetric, anti-symmetric in Ij. This is not symmetric or anti-symmetric in Ij. It is a mixed thing because arbitrary pi and pi j. So let's write this in the form of a symmetric and anti-symmetric combination first. And let's see the consequences of that theorem that when you multiply two tensors, one fully symmetric, one fully anti-symmetric, you get zero. I'm going to use that theorem for, let me write this in the form of anti-symmetric one plus symmetric one. You can see that the first one is anti-symmetric, second is a, so it's an identity. The first terms add up to give you pi i pi j. The second terms in those brackets are cancel. So this is anti-symmetric and that's anti-symmetric. So it's going to lead to something non-zero. But that is anti-symmetric and this one is symmetric in ij. If you interchange i and j, it doesn't change. Therefore, the second term vanishes. So this extra, this extra, if I denote it with a shorthand name delta H, is going to be then, delta H is going to be I over 4M, I over 2M was here already, there is a, there is a one half coming from there, so. Epsilon I J K, sigma K, pi I, pi J. Okay. We have worked out the pi i pi j commutator before last time and showed that it is related to the magnetic field. It's only obvious that it should be so because pi, the kinetic momentum, are p minus vector potential in each. p and p, canonical momentum, commute, a and a commute. Only the cross terms, P, A, and A, P, none vanish, they, they do not vanish. P on A gives you the derivative of A and minus the opposite index. Derivative of A's are related to magnetic field. It's only natural that you should get the magnetic field out of this. And we have seen that it was E over C. E over C is because, now I can write it out of, you know, my heart, essentially. I don't have to redo it. E over C, because in the pi there is E over C A. That's E over C. I H bar, because P momenta are the I H bar times the derivatives. And the derivatives of A anti-symmetrized is the epsilon I J K B K. Notation-wise, I made a mistake on purpose. What is it? Well, this k was already contracted and summed. i and j are the free indices in here. So I cannot use the already contracted indices in here. I have to use another dummy index. Repeated, BL. OK, let me contract. There is epsilon i j k, epsilon i j l, that gives you twice delta j l, the contraction of two indices, the usual rule. So what do I have? i over 4 m, well i squared, that's a minus. And e over e h bar over m c, I over 4 e h bar over m c. Okay, times sig b that sigma. Mm, 
No, it's the one half because I, I had out of contraction of epsilons, I have two. So that kills, let me write it cleanly, minus a half. Okay. So this is the delta H, the additional piece in the non-relativistic Hamiltonian. Okay. Fine. So let me write the non-relativistic Hamiltonian together, all together. H and R, one over two M phi squared plus E phi, the usual part, minus E h bar divided by 2mc beta dot sigma is the new piece. Yes. Now, let me go back to the spin in. Now, this is in two dimensions, and phi are two dimensional uh, spinors. So we know the two dimensional physics quite well. And how this spin is related to the Pauli matrices in two dimensions h bar over 2 sigma are the spin in the two dimensions, in the non relativistic limit. Therefore, I can re rewrite the sigma using the s, that is 2s divided by h bar. h bars cancel. So I have the usual piece. Let me not rewrite the entire thing. Minus E over MC B dot sigma is the form of the non-relativistic. S, sorry, S of course. Okay. Well, some of you already recognize that the Zeeman term is making its appearance. If there was no electromagnetic interaction, of course, this reduces to what? Let me immediately say, if A mu is zero, that's free object, this entire thing reduces to one over two m p squared, that is zero, and that's zero is p one over two mp squared. That's a really the free particle Hamiltonian in the non elastic limit. I mean there is no interaction. Even that's true not only for the spinless objects, for the spinful objects, when the, there is no interaction, of course you cannot probe the spin. It behaves like an ordinary spinless object. It, Electromagnetic, you can probe the electromagnetism either with a charge or with a magnetic movement, right? These are the probes of electromagnetism. If you have no electromagnetism, the charge or spin doesn't matter, so you get the ordinary free particle kinetic operator. But anyway, as I said, that's a trivial case. Let me work out still in the interaction. Let me continue the discussion in the interaction case. Let me focus now on the usual part, the pi squared. So what is pi squared? Pi squared is, we worked this out very repeatedly in the past, it is p minus e over c a squared. So it's p squared minus e over c a dot p plus p dot a plus e squared over c squared a squared. Okay. Well, in order to see something concrete coming out, let me do the following. Let me consider an external magnetic field, B pure magnetic field, constant and homogeneous. Constant 
and homogeneous. Homogeneous means space constant. Constant means constant. No time dependence or no space dependence. Think of a large uh, electromagnet and the, between the poles you can uh, construct a magnetic field of this sort. And you can uh, construct the A associated with this in the Coulomb gauge. Obviously, when you are constructing potentials from the electromagnetic fields, which are the things that you actually create in the laboratory, you need to fix the gauge. If I use the Coulomb gauge, then I have phi equals zero, and divergence of A should satisfy equal to zero. So how do I construct this? I construct this in the following manner. A is equal to one half B cross R. You can verify, the easiest way is to verify that the divergence of this is equal to zero and the curl of this gives you the B. Check. These two checks, please do it on your own that divergence of A is equal to zero and the curl of A is equal to B. Very nice because this is the construction and that's the verification of the construction. Very good. So let me elaborate further. Thanks to the Coulomb gauge fixing a dot p is equal to p dot a because the additional term is divergence of a which vanishes. So pi squared is p squared minus twice e over c a dot p plus e squared over c squared a squared. You have to retain it till you are convinced that it's so weak that you can drop it. Otherwise there is no good mathematical reason to drop it. Okay. So let me focus on this term. If I substitute this one half B cross R for the A dotted into P for this particular configuration. So it is this mixed product is symmetric, right? To see that is to go to the indices first. Epsilon, I, J, K, B, J, R, K, P, I is the way you write it in the indices. Epsilon, J, no, KI, JK. So it is what? It is the LJ. So this becomes P squared minus, there's the 2 and 2 which cancels E over C B dot L plus E squared over C squared A squared. How nice. So this pi squared, kinetic momentum squared, is the canonical momentum squared times this nice B dot L term. And there's a quadratic A squared term, of course. If you are interested in working out the Landau levels, then you have to retain that term. So let me write now the full Hamiltonian, the entire thing. H, non-relativistic, is equal to 1 over 2m, no, p squared over 2m, that's the term, minus e over 2mc b dot l term, minus e over c mc b dot s term, plus this e squared over 2mc squared a squared term is the A squared. If, if the A is too weak, then that could be dropped. 
But the most important parts are, of course, there is the kinetic term, p squared over 2 term, 2m term, plus that term. I will write in that corner because that's an important expression, which was sort of one of the things which helped the acceptance of the Dirac equation as the correct relativistic quantum mechanical equation. So then it becomes non-relativistic Hamiltonian is p squared over 2m minus combine these two terms minus e over 2mc b dot l plus 2s plus e squared over 2mc squared a squared. When people have seen this, g equals to the gyromagnetic ratio of the electron is equal to 2. That was the proof of gyromagnetic ratio is equal to 2. So that is considered as one of the big victories of the Dirac equation and that helped tremendously in its acceptance as the correct relativistic equation. So that's it. For the, we had the general reduction and for this very specific final form, a constant homogeneous magnetic field, then we, ha we have obtained the usual form, verifying that g equals 2. The next I will consider another interesting problem. It is the non-relativistic limit of the Dirac equation in the presence of a central potential which is obviously related to the hydrogen atom, right? You have the Coulomb problem. You can solve it exactly using Dirac equation, as it is done in more, in more advanced parts of this book. Unfortunately, we won't have time to reach to that discussion, uh, exact relativistic solution of the hydrogen atom. But what we are going to do here today, starting in the second hour, is to consider this particular problem. There is a Dirac particle in the presence of a Coulomb field and work out the non-relativistic limit, taking into account the fact that at the atomic regime, the relative speeds are alpha times the C. And we'll see that the kinetic energy correction, spin orbit correction, and the Darwin term particularly comes out as a result of this reduction. Remember, we have constructed them by hand, sort of. Starting, uh, staying in the non-relativistic quantum mechanics, it's easy to construct the kinetic energy corrections. I have started discussion with that, it's easy. P squared to the squared. And spin orbit was sort of easy again because when you are in relativity, spin is bound to come, but with a mistake in the coefficient of the strength. It was, uh, it missed by a factor of one half. That naive approach missed it one half. So we had to modify it using the so-called sophisticated mechanism of Thomas precession. But there was no trace of Darwin at all from the non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So it is the place to get all those beautiful terms coming all together with the correct signs. So it, we'll do that in the next hour. <laughs>